if the Tsar bomb were detonated over Milan. The explosion would affect all of Lombardy and parts of Piedmont and Switzerland. For this video, we've created a reconstruction of the inside of the Tsar Bomba in 3D to show you how the most powerful nuclear weapon ever made works. But let's clarify one thing right away. It's never actually been used against any real targets and has only been tested once in a remote and completely uninhabited area of Russia. Moreover, on that occasion, on October 30th, 1961, it was tested at half power, that is, at 50 megatons instead of 100 megatons. But how much is that exactly? Imagine that this grain of rice is a one kiloton atomic bomb. The kiloton is the basic unit usually used to measure explosive power. If this grain were to explode, it would release a power equivalent to about a thousand tons of TNT. To be clear, since I'm in the lawn and using it as an example, if for the sake of argument such a bomb were detonated over Piazza Duomo, it would not only blow up the square, but also the surrounding neighborhoods. This, on the other hand, is the Hiroshima bomb, which is 15 kilotons or 15 grains of rice. Instead, if we want to make the one from Nagasaki, we need to add a few more grains of rice to take the total up to 21, making it 21 kilotons. So, this is the one from Nagasaki. We're all familiar with them, and it's clear, visually, how much more powerful they are compared to the bomb we saw earlier. If we take the one from Nagasaki, its explosion wouldn't just destroy one neighborhood in the line, or two neighborhoods, but the entire historic center, and there would also be significant damage to the rest of the city due to the bomb's blast. And it's certainly not the most powerful nuclear bomb ever designed. If we wanted the power of the Tsar Bomba, it would be this. That's 100 megatons. Obviously, guys, we're not going to waste this rice. It won't be thrown away. Don't worry. So we're talking about a device that's 6,700 times more powerful than the one that leveled Hiroshima and claimed the lives of 140,000 people. The comparison is already very clear. In terms of damage, if such a bomb were dropped on the line, not only would the historic center be destroyed, not only the city of Milan and the nearby towns, but also about half of Lombardy and parts of Piedmont and Switzerland. The cities of Mantua, Varese, Lutko, and Como in Lombardy, and many, many others, would be razed to the ground. So, we're talking about a terrifying weapon, and this very weapon will be the protagonist of our story. We are in the midst of the Cold War. The images of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were still very vivid in the minds of the population. And precisely because of this, the fear of a potential nuclear attack was very high. A fear, I would say, is quite justified, given that the Soviet and American elites were about to start a new race to create the most powerful nuclear weapon. This time, however, it was the Soviets, driven by President Nikita Khrushchev, who were in the lead, and they became the first to obtain the ultimate weapon of destruction, technically known as the RDS-220 hydrogen bomb, or more familiarly, the Tsar Bomba. It was eight meters in length, with a diameter of two meters, and weighed about 25 tons. As previously mentioned, the Tsar Bomba is a hydrogen bomb, which means it's a fusion bomb. What happens is that, under high temperature and high density conditions, the hydrogen nuclei fuse together, releasing enormous amounts of energy. And how are the necessary temperatures achieved? With the explosion of the fission device that is built into the bomb. The Tsar Bomba is therefore divided into two parts, a sphere in which plutonium fission occurs, that is, the splitting of nuclei, and an internal cylinder within the bone, where hydrogen fusion instead occurs. The sphere is made up of multiple layers of explosive material, with a plutonium sphere at its center, while the cylinder consists of a hollow uranium cylinder containing a cylinder of lithium deuteride and one of plutonium. The parts are suspended in polystyrene foam, which is commonly but incorrectly referred to as styrofoam. When the weapon is dropped and reaches the predetermined altitude, sensors trigger the ignition of the first spherical bomb. Thanks to the high pressure generated inside it, a nuclear fission reaction of the plutonium sphere is set in motion. This generates an enormous amount of heat, with temperatures reaching up to 100 million degrees, which means we're talking about a temperature higher than that of the sun. Enormous quantities of X-rays and gamma rays are also produced, which, along with the heat, cause the polystyrene to be transformed into plasma. At this point, the plasma violently compresses the cylinder. 
This generates nuclear fission reactions in the uranium and plutonium, which in turn further compress the central layer of lithium iodide, ultimately leading to a nuclear fusion reaction. This, this entire process lasts approximately 0.1 microseconds and culminates in a violent release of energy. So, that's how it works in theory. But to be really sure of its effectiveness, there was only one thing left to do. An official test. The test was to take place on October 30th, 1961. A safe testing area was identified in the Ishika Bay in the Northern Arctic Circle. Since the test was to be conducted on Russian soil, to limit the amount of possible damage and radiation, they decided to have the bomb's power. Therefore, the explosion would actually generate a power of 50 megatons instead of 100. Note that the images you are about to see come from a Rosatom documentary that remained classified until 2020 and has only recently been made public. To transport the weapon to the site, a Tu-95V bomber piloted by Major Andrei Dernasev was used. Once it reached its destination, the Tsar Bomba was dropped from an altitude of about 10,000 meters attached to a parachute. The explosion was the largest ever in human history. A mushroom cloud 40 kilometers wide and 64 kilometers high was generated, which is seven times taller than Mount Everest. And its 94 kilometer wide top was actually outside the stratosphere. Contrary to what one might imagine, the flames didn't reach the ground. The silk wave was so powerful that it bounced off the ground and sent the flames upward. For this reason, relatively little radioactive material reached the ground, and by that I obviously mean relatively little compared to the bomb's power. However, this doesn't mean that there was no damage. The shock wave completely leveled an area with a diameter of 55 kilometers and generated an earthquake with a magnitude of around 5. And windows even broke in Norway and Finland. Just imagine that if the weapon had been dropped in a populated area, people 100. Kilometers away would have suffered third-degree burns, and at a distance of 270 kilometers, they would have felt the heat of the explosion. Fortunately, such a powerful weapon was never used against real targets, and of course it is hoped that it never will be. But in theory, would it be possible to create even more powerful weapons? In reality, it's hard to say. It's possible that future technology will give rise to even more devastating weapons, but fortunately, there are international treaties that heavily restrict, if not completely prohibit, a testing of atomic weapons. Without tests, creating such powerful weapons is extremely complicated, so, at least for now, it seems that this sad record will remain unbeaten for quite some time. At the same time, unfortunately, we must keep in mind that it's not just the power of a single bomb that makes the difference, but also the number of bombs countries have in their arsenals. Anyway, this is a topic we could say so much about, so if you're interested, let me know in the comments and we'll create some content about it. Alright guys, thanks for watching up to this point. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you want more videos on specific weapons or particular types of bombs, let me know. I'll see you soon for another video, right here on Geopop Everyday Science.